Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Mark Steiner. Great to have you with us. When Colin Kaepernick took the knee during the national anthem, it inspired other players to follow suit, to protest racism and police brutality in America. It also led to an intense reaction that laid bare the deepest divides in America, around race, how we define ourselves as a country, and what it means to be an American. Donald Trump joined the fray, not to heal, but to push his own, some would say racist and nationalist agenda. The other day, a landmark decision was handed down in a suit that Kaepernick brought against the NFL. Arbitrator Stephen Burbank denied the NFL's request for summary judgment. Well, what does that mean? It means now that all 32 teams can remain part of that suit, where collusion between the owners might be brought to bear to deny Kaepernick a right to play in the NFL. That could be the ruling. We'll find out. Now, the NFL anthem policy will not be settled by the opening of the football season. And this trial, so-called trial, will take place at the end of the year. And America will remain deeply divided on this issue still. To help us parse through all of this is Charles Grantham, who's director of the Center for Sports Management and faculty associate at Seton Hall University. As a former union representative and executive with the National Basketball Players Association, he changed the nature of the NBA itself. He's represented and worked with many players and has, worked, has been deeply, deeply involved in equity issues surrounding professional sports in our country. And Charles Grantham, it's a pleasure to have you with us. We've seen you many times in the media all across this country, and welcome to The Real News for the first time. Well, thank you for having me it's very pleasure. much. Pleasure to have you with us. So as we jump into this, let's listen earlier to what President Donald Trump had to say, and we'll leap right into our conversation with Charles Grantham. Wouldn't you love to see one of these NFL owners when somebody disrespects our flag, to say, get that son of a off the field right now, out, he's fired. I thought it was important to set that up, Charles, first, just because th th this is an issue that has really been used by some political figures and others to really divide this country, and it's really set people up. We saw this odd thing where many uh, African Americans and people who want to fight racism in America were saying, don't go to NFL games because they're, um, because what the NFL owners are doing and going after players taking the knee. Then you had a lot of other people saying, we're not going to go to the games because they're taking the knee. I mean, this really has become symbolic of something much deeper in our society, I think. Yes, but what I, what you see here, I think, is a, is a failure of, of leadership from both uh, management uh, and labor to address this issue properly. In other words, uh, it's more complicated than obviously taking a knee in a demonstration uh, for, with regard to policing our communities and et cetera. Uh, but in order to resolve this issue, you're, you're going to have to have people talk to each other and listen to each other. And that doesn't seem to be happening between both the owners and the commissioner and also uh, the players' union. The, the players would like to see an engagement. They'd like to see the owners engaged in helping deal with a, a, an issue that is dear to all of our hearts. And um, they don't seem to be accommodating right now. So with regard to this particular issue of collusion, um, let's not get a little bit too excited about what this hearing said. It essentially said there's enough information here to carry this forward and have a full hearing on whether or not uh, there was a conspiracy to, to keep uh, uh, Colin Kaepernick uh, out of the NFL. Um, now, this, there's a linkage between all of this. A, the protests. Now you have young players taking a knee in protest of the fact that Kaepernick is not employed. That's sort of a separate protest within the context of social justice and the issue that was raised, raised initially. So, uh, we're at the beginning of the process here. It, uh, it could suggest that maybe uh, the parties will finally get together and resolve not only the collusion and the protest, but also the anthem issue around it. Uh, it, it, it sets there now to be to perhaps be settled because we're now moving into a full-blown hearing. And one of the things I think is pretty clear now that the depositions that have, they've had there's information that is coming out to support Kaepernick's claim. Um, should have been that originally, should have been probably driven. This entire thing should have been driven by the union because it affects all players and particularly affects those players now who have 
taken a knee or protested, and now they become free agents, and the whole question of collusion sits with them because are they going to retain their job? Are they going to get a new contract, et cetera? All these things are yet to be answered. So uh, at a time when race is often the elephant in the room here, it's front and center now. And the question of race, you know, I go back to the 80s with the NBA when it was perceived that the NBA was too black and it was drug infested. And cocaine was a major issue with regard to from our players. So we had a, a really bad public persona perception. Our TV ratings are down. Our attendance was down. The finals were shown tape delay. But the one thing we learned and embraced is that we had a black product selling to white America. The NFL owners haven't got that yet. That 80% of the players are black because they embrace our culture. You got to sell them as and promote them as the stars that they are, uh, and engage in the issues that, uh, of course, that they are now involved in. And we're slow to respond. And here, the president of the United States putting his finger in the relationship between players and owners, which is a collectively bargained relationship, and which the idea of a mandatory stand for the national anthem was never embodied in that agreement. So they weren't really in violation of the agreement in the first place. So while they may have a mandatory stand in the NDA, it was collectively negotiated and things were given to the players in return for uh, that alliance. So we're, we're right in the middle here. It doesn't look like there's any time soon that you're going to see a resolve. Um, but one thing is for certain that Colin Kaepernick, the fact that they said we were not going to dismiss the charge, that we are now going to present it for a full-blown hearing, and there'll be far more and many more depositions, far more facts to come out. Uh, I'm of the belief at some point there, there's a settlement here because I don't believe in the end the NFL would like to hear or have some of those things become public. Uh, and nor do I believe that the idea that if, in fact, the players prevail, there's an opportunity, therefore, to blow up the entire collective bargaining agreement, which I doubt will happen. So there are a lot of factors here. But the biggest factor that made this so national was that for the first time we saw a president involve himself in an employer-employee relationship that really had nothing to do with him, on the one hand. On the other hand, there are several owners who are his Start supporters. So as soon as that dialogue was created between the president and various owners, you knew that this had to take on a more serious uh, implications because there were conversations that took place between so, the president and some of those owners. So let me ask a couple of questions of what you just said. Um, mm -hmm. So if it is shown that there was collusion with the owners to deny Colin Kaepernick the right to play, I mean, what what could be the possible outcome of this? I mean, you, I know you said earlier that they may settle this early so that it does not happen and all the things will not come tumbling out uh, in terms of what the owners and other people have said. But, I mean, what, what, what can be the effect of all of this in terms of what it would mean for the NFL, other players? I mean, and if, and if, collusion, was, if collusion was proven or, or shown in, in a large way to be to most likely be the fact, the fact in the case, what would that really mean? Well, first of all, there's damages for Colin Kaepernick in terms of how much money would be involved. Of course, um, usually collusion in antitrust cases like this, you're talking about triple damages or you're talking about a substantial amount of money. And how it may affect the whole concept of free agency going forward is yet another issue that would have to be resolved. Um, so the ramifications could be great but that's also why I believe that between now and as this thing is drawn out in terms of its process, it could be another four, five, six months that the parties will come to terms with some other resolve or some way to settle this thing without it getting to the point where uh, if the NFL is proven guilty. And, and, and by the way, you know, clear preponderance of evidence is a very high standard, and they know that as well. So that time is going to go by here, and I think you'll start to see some adjustments. But I don't believe 
that um, we'll see the agreement being blown up. Um, I don't think that it's going to be the, the maximum penalty that could be uh, awarded here, which would be substantial financial damages. But at the same time, he's got to consider a, a better system in terms of the players who have protested or and or the players who are likely to become free agents and how they're going to be affected in a system like this. Because collusion is a real difficult thing to prove, but it also is very damaging to your sport if, in fact, that is uh, absolutely proven. So there are two things here that I want to ask you before we conclude. And one has to do with a quote that you made that was in The Hill, which is the newspaper on Capitol Hill that comes out of Washington, D.C. And the quote is, politically, if you're an arbitrator in a case as big as this, there's no way to throw it out. We knew that as soon as Donald Trump put his finger, fingerprints on the issue. So, so right. flesh that out for us. What, what, what's behind yeah, that well, statement? Well, flesh it out is an arbitrator is different than a judge. So that an arbitrator is, is a lot more, let's say, uh, vulnerable to politics simply because he's paid by both sides and both sides have to agree to retain him. So he has a tendency to try to get the parties to resolve this and settle it in some way. So as soon as the president put his finger in, then all of a sudden that question of collusion, the collusion from the standpoint of donors who had supported him financially, then you knew that this was going to take on just a greater importance than the typical grievance that may come down the pike here. Um, and so I knew that was going to be, go to the full hearing. There's no way that he could throw this one out, A, because of the public pressure, B, internally, and C, the players who, who have uh, sacrificed their careers here at this point. It's far more important than uh, the initial, let's say, a, a grievance that is normally filed. So, and remember that he's not a, a judge. Usually, cases like this in the past have been handled by what we call a special master. That means that the court would oversee this agreement, and it takes on more of a, a judicial and legal uh, trial, whereas a hearing in arbitration is not really a trial. It's a hearing, and you don't have a judge. You have an arbitrator, and an arbitrator who is compensated by both parties. So... The grievance and the grievance mechanism in terms of dispute resolution is different than going through the courts. So one thing, I know that you're not a political commentator <laughs> and know that you're not a, a, a answer these kind of questions in terms of the, the kind of the, the philosophically where our country is going. But to me, at the heart of this question, beyond what happens with the arbitrator and how this falls out in in December, we have a football season upon us where probably an agreement will not take place around the anthem. I know we're going to see more comments from uh, Donald Trump. Uh, this will continue to divide, to divide America. And you have been intimately involved with many players, uh, know their feelings and ideas and thoughts. So I'm just curious what you think of, under the, all of this, what this might mean for the future of athletics in, the, in this country when you see so many black players saying it's time to stand up and say no, there are a few players who are not black, white players who are, who are standing with them. So, I mean, what, what, what does all this mean to you in terms of what, what, what this portends for the future? Well, I just think that the presence, uh, let's go back to uh, Nelson Mandela said, sports can change the world. Right. And essentially he did some of that within his continent in, in, in South Africa by using rugby, which was a, a predominantly white sport, brought it into the black community. And when they had the world championships in Johannesburg, the stadium was well integrated, full, and it was festive. So he used sport. And I think we're, what we're starting to see, and you look at the, the basketball players speaking out in similar fashion, but in different ways is that our young athletes are taking a stand because they believe that they owe that to their community, that they have the forum and they can advance change in an agenda. And I think you're gonna see that change in agenda. But I think it starts with this friction and this clash right now. But ultimately, I believe, if you take again, look at the, the NBA, the NBA is far more receptive to, uh, to the players being involved in social issues encouraging and when uh, Donald Sterling 
stepped out of line. They got him out of basketball. That was an action that they took. But that action started to help the attitude of the players that, hey, guess what? We may be in unison in trying to make these advancements. And so all of a sudden the owners, I think, in basketball, moving from being facilitators, i.e. showing how players act in the community by serving as a platform, to actually becoming engaged with the players. We see games now in South Africa. That's because of a movement that we started back in in the early 90s, and now both the owners and players are committed to doing that. You're going to see the same thing ultimately in football, I believe, but it's got to flush itself out. So do you see, I'm just curious again, as we conclude here, knowing the players as you do um, and the work you've done in the NBA and continue to do throughout sports, do you see any kind of unity taking place between black players and some of the white players, Pacific Islander players, others in this, or has this become, again, is there a bridge to be built here, or is this continuing well, to divide? Well, I think the bridge is there. I think there's, it's, it's far more uh, progressive than it has been. Um, I think that uh, the NAACP uh, legal fund, for example, um, you know, that brought us the uh, separate but equal I think that the a player's ability to utilize uh, the legal fund of the NAACP may help advance in the similar issues that we're dealing now with within our community. I think that's all on its way. I don't know that it's quite there yet, but, we, but it has to first start with players feeling responsible and engaged and having passion for assisting our community. And I think you're starting to see that throughout college and professional level here. Well, Charles Grantham, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're having a tremendously busy schedule. It's great to talk to you. Uh, and I look forward to talking to you again and seeing how this unfolds. I think this is something that's at the heart of, of uh, America and struggling about who we are as Americans. And I appreciate you taking the time. Totally agree with you. Just keep an eye on it. It's maybe slow. It's going to take some time. But uh, I think ultimately we're going to see a resolve. Nothing wrong with slow sometimes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Charles. Okay, thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being with us here. I'm Mark Stein of The Real News Network. Take care.